So today we're going to talk about fabrics and other somewhat similar materials. And by that I mean like leather, you know, other things that kind of fall under this that are all sort of textiles, I guess, in a way. Um, one of the first things that I want to focus on is I think a big way that people can improve the way that their cloth, fabrics, and everything look are to properly account for the volumes in it. Um, a lot of the time, especially for newer painters, when I see people approaching something like a cloak or another big piece of fabric that has a lot of dips and curves to it, um, they really tend to just paint these prominent surfaces on the top. Um, and I think that looks okay when you're starting off, like it, it'll still get the effect, but something that I really started paying a lot more attention to is to think about you know, what you would call the faces of, of these fabrics here, the planes of them. Um, this is taken from the FAQ2 on, on miniature painting by um, Arnaud Lazaro. I think it's a really good, quick, just little image that shows you what, what I'm going to be talking about. So when we see these curves, right, if light's hitting it from above here, this is on the same plane as this interior curve is. You can see how he's sort of sketched it out down here. And it's going to get basically the same amount of light. Maybe a little bit less, but if our, if the sun is the object that's lighting our scene, this is about as far away from the sun as this is, so there's not going to be a huge disparity. And the places that you're really going to see dark in the shadows are, are either places where the light's being occluded from hitting, or just it's not facing in the same direction as the rest of the planes. Um, even, you know, today we're going to use a lot of very sort of textural brush strokes and stippling and stuff like that to accomplish a lot of our textures, but I think it's still important in the beginning to take a look at the overall shape of what you're painting and think about, you know, where light's going to be hitting, to what intensity, which things are all on the same plane facing in the same direction. Even if I know I'm going to be doing a lot of really textural work, I'll still kind of take you know, something a little bit lighter than my base color and sketch in these planes first, just so I have a good reference point for myself moving forward of where I'm going to be placing the light in the shadow. Um, again, I don't think it's, you know, it's not like, hey, this is, this is wrong. Don't ever do this. This will just set your stuff up to look more convincing in my mind. Um, you just get a better look out of the cloth. It feels more natural. I, I think it's something that's really fun as a mental experiment to look at these different shapes in the model and try to figure out, okay, where is this light coming from? Where is it going to hit? Where is it going to be the strongest? Um, so the bit first thing, right, is like, what material do you want to paint? Fabric has such a wide range and leather has such a wide range of how it looks. You know, you could go from brand new, fresh out of production, super shiny leather that doesn't have any scuffs all the way across to something that's so worn and weather beaten that like the the finished surface of the leather is basically gone. You're getting a lot of the fiber showing. Those are going to catch light completely differently. They're going to have completely different levels of information on them. Um, and it's all about, I think, deciding what you want to paint and really kind of investigating it a bit to find out, you know, hey, what is this? What makes this what it is? You know, and that's the first thing is finding reference, right? Go on Google Images or, or Pinterest or ArtStation or whatever and try to find something close like you don't have to find the exact thing if you can't find green damask fabric with gold trim that's okay find a green damask fabric find something else that has gold trim Com combine them in your mind get as close as you can to the final look that you're going to want to have on that part of your model the next and i think this is the most important part is to sit and look at it for a bit try and identify you know what are the attributes of this fabric that make me know it's this fabric. I think a lot of us, you know, like if you see something like blue jeans, everyone kind of has seen blue jeans, you know what they look like, you, you know what to expect. But I don't think a lot of the time we sit down and think like, okay, but what makes, you know, blue denim look like blue denim to us? And the biggest thing is that it's got a pretty big range from, from blue to white most of the time. And the, the way that it's put on, those things together are going to give us the illusion that, hey, this is wearing denim right now. Um, because we're not painting one-to-one -one stuff, uh, we do have to think about how the information is going to scale down to whatever size model you have, and what's going to be the most effective way of representing it, of getting that information across, of getting something convincing. The way that you're going to do 
like a leather belt on like a 28 millimeter guy is going to be a little bit different than how you do it on a 75 millimeter or bust or something. There's just not as much room for quite as much information. So some of it does get simplified a little bit. Um, so a, a big part of this is, is game planning. I think the more planning you do with something like fabric, you know, ahead of time, getting a mental image of what you want it to look like, the easier time you could have following through on it and getting it to look the way that, that, that you'd hoped for. Um, again, just to take a look at some different materials and, and think about why they sell to us what they sell. Like obviously up here with this leather, we can see that it's distressed. It's been folded a lot of times. It's been worn. The finished surface is starting to wear away, revealing you know, the fibers underneath, which are going to be a lighter color as opposed to whatever dye was used to color it this way. Um, something like really rough spun cloth you're gonna like if you think about this it's just a lot of stippling right it's a lot of really small dots next to each other that are going to give us this illusion of overlapping fibers that are creating this this matrix and depending on how big or small you make that you get a different feel for the size of the you know the fiber that was woven together to make this this is a you know this is a much bigger weave than this is here. It's a lot tighter over here. It's a lot broader. You can get cool patterns like, you know, an alternating knit and pearl like you would get with knitting. This is going to be, you know, starting with a darker color, marking in these sort of chevron shapes and lighter color and keeping them alternating. And that's going to give you a really cool knit look. Um, something like satin or silk is going to be really highly reflective. So you're highlights are going to be much tighter bands versus something broader like cotton here you, know, you can see like where the lights hitting this white shirt you're getting a lot softer shadows you're getting a lot more diffused highlights across it there's not as big of a value change here you know this is going from just a very you know light off white to off white to white whereas this is basically going from black all the way up to white almost and i think with silk and satin you, you can bring it up to white especially on miniatures to really show that hey this is a really shiny fabric um one thing to note too though and here is you can see this does kind of just look like a lot of little dots right and the place that you see the most amount of the little dots is going to be in the midtones uh, where you hit your shadows and your full highlights it's either going to be too dark to see the little bits of information giving you those little those little dots those little points and the same in the extreme highlights where the amount of light is just blowing out that information so i think part of it too is finding the balance of where you need to concentrate the information to give you the right look in the end um, all of these i think are pretty fun like this this sort of knit one is one that I really want to try soon just because I think it's really interesting. Um, I've got some examples of, of other people on miniatures where they show a bunch of different fabrics on different materials. This is one that I've seen Mark Masklans do. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's like, in my opinion, one of the better fabric material painters out there because he spends a lot of time looking at, you know, how, how do I accomplish this? Um, He's got some great little slide by or side by sides on his Instagram. I would go check it out. It's Mark with a C, M A R C, Mass Clans. Um, I can post that in the chat thing later too. Uh, this is some of his work. You know, you can see exactly that sort of knit pattern here. For me, this is really convincing, right? But he's got a lot of good mix of materials here. We really get a sense of this aged, tattered leather exterior to the jacket, where he's bringing a lot of different tones in to show that it's not just this black dye it's been worn past that to the underlying layers um, similarly with this sort of sheepskin interior here you really get that because of the shapes that he's made and, and the size of them and how they're layered that sort of sense of that fluffy overlapping sheepskin material where it's got some darks and lights and different tones throughout it because it's very natural similarly on this one over here you've got much softer broader lights on this you know cotton kind of shirt here and then much more textural information on all the leathers around it you can see a lot of stippling in here really giving you that sense of like a worn leather where it's picking up a lot of 
you know, wearing away, giving you more information, giving you the sense that it's that it's well used. You know, compare this to like a really fresh leather look where it's going to be super shiny. It's going to be a lot crisper highlights. As it gets more worn away, there's less reflective material, and the light's going to diffuse on it quite a bit more. Um, you see too here, like there's a lot of that paying attention to the volumes of cloth and how it catches light. There's a lot of attention here, right, to how this has a, a, a curve because of her breasts where it's catching up here and then it's slightly darker under here, but it's not going like all the way to a black or something for the most part. Um, this is some more of, of Mark's work. I really think like this leather looks super nice to me. It really gives you that feel of this is a really tattered piece of leather where a lot like there's still a little bit of sheen in the parts that are the original you know dye and polish to it but for the most part it's worn away down into the underlying materials um, I just like looking at material or, or, or models that have a lot of different materials I think it's just a really interesting look of, of balancing everything you've got this really kind of cool pattern going on in, in this glove type thing that she's wearing that makes it feel like a wholly different material than her shirt or this thing wrapped around her neck or her, her leather hat or anything like that. Um, this last one, this one's from Dave Colwell. I think this does another really good job of, of giving you a real different feel of different materials. Like you kind of get this crushed velvet feel from the lining of this box because of the way the lights are put onto it, how dark it gets, you get a lot higher contrast, making it feel like a much shinier material than these white robes, which really only go down to like a purplish off-white for the most part. They're not getting nearly as dark as you would on this crushed velvet, just because it's not as you know high of a contrast of a material. And even sort of this like uh, you know cloth of gold that you have here, you can see how it even in comparison to the white, it has a much higher range of contrast. We're going up to basically pure white here in the highlights because it's a more reflective material. Um, Dave Cole is another one that I, I really recommend if you want to step up your like texturing and fabric game, go check out his Instagram, zoom in on his work on Punny and Paint and stuff. Uh, he's someone who works almost entirely by stippling. So you get some really interesting um, you know, brushstroke information throughout his work. He, his stipples are very, very small, very overlapping of, of different consistencies, and that make, gives it this overall smooth look, whereas in fact, if you really zoomed in, there's a lot of just tiny, tiny, tiny dots here, um, which I personally think is a, a really effective way to paint cloth, and it's something that we'll look at a bit when we go over to, you know, doing a, a demonstration in a second here. Um, all right. That's basically it for the lecture. It was a short one today. There's not... I don't think there's too, too much on the theory side. I think a lot of painting fabric comes from, like I said, checking your reference and then experimenting with your brush and seeing if the two line up for you. If they don't, then it's the, the third thing, right? Of figuring out why what was on paper didn't translate to the model and, and where you need to go back and, and maybe change your efforts or, or move things around. All right, I'm going to switch this over to the camera now. Ba -ba -ba. Red, you're going to have to yell at me if I go out of frame. Great. No issue there. Great. All right, let's just make sure we can see. So I just have this Odin model from Hera. I thought this would be a pretty good one because he's just kind of covered in cloth. Let's see if I can get my camera to zoom in a little bit. I'll just work on his hood a little bit. It does have a little bit of a zenithal on it. Actually, there's some glitter on it. That's weird. Um, just get a brush to clean this off with because it's dusty. If anyone has any questions about the lecture part, now is a pretty good time to chime in. There are questions. Shoot them. Do them. Mr. Peach asks, I wonder how much the color used influences the way a material will turn out to look like versus how much you can, quote, mock it by replicating the shading of the material itself, e.g. silk versus cotton. And by color, I mean the actual pigment slash manufacturer. I am of the opinion that, like, no matter what you're painting, it doesn't matter what paint you're using, like, 99% of the time. Um, it really comes down to volume and light 
more than anything else i think with most things in miniature painting like obviously if you like a certain color from a certain manufacturer and you want to use it go for it um i don't really find that there's a limitation though on what works better for you know doing this than something else let's go through some base color um so i'm gonna just do sort of like a stippled textural pattern on this guy's hood i'm just gonna start with sort of like a dark sea blue and work my way up to kind of an off white but i just figured i'd give a little you know, show how I would do this. And then we'll do some leather too, because I, I like doing leather, it's fun. I'm just gonna throw a quick base coat on with some dark bluish tone. Uh, Hilo Pilot asked, are people really painting the knitted patterns where there is no texture for the knitted patterns? I already answered this in text, but uh, this is a technique you're gonna see more on larger pro larger miniatures, like I said in the text chat, 75 millimeter minis, boss, etc. When you get down to like gaming scale, 28 millimeter stuff, you tend to see more uh, implied texture through stippling and things like that, rather than specifically like here's a bunch of stitching or here are the lines of the the threads and stuff. Yeah, you're definitely more trying to give the impression of cloth rather than the actual like threads and whatnot. yeah def definitely agree there um like i just finished doing this uh bust a little while ago like you're you're not gonna try and paint like a wave texture like this on a 28 millimeter model uh it's just it's not gonna you're just gonna be exercising frustration even like this level of like stippling in the cloth you're gonna have to simplify this a lot to get it to work you know on something that's this big comparatively uh, there's just not enough room for for all the information. I think you could definitely still have have it be very effective, but I wouldn't, you know, don't bash your head against the wall trying to get something done that's just like not super feasible. I'm just gonna go over to my airbrush and dry this off real quick so we can keep cracking. Uh, he also asks, how do you simplify it? That's tough. I mean, it it really depends on like material to material. Like for something like that you know, knit material, I just wouldn't even try and do that, honestly, because, like, I would just kind of roughly stipple and give it the impression that it's of a knit. And maybe you don't get the pattern in there, but you still get that little tiny dot matrix going that gives you enough information. Um, so for fabric, I'm, I kind of have my own opinion about using brushes for stippling. Um, I think for something like this, you know, generally what I would do is for the bigger, earlier portion of it, if I didn't want super specifically tiny, tiny dots all the way from dark to light, I'm going to use something bigger and cheaper and shittier, like this old Citadel brush I got for free. Um, just because the, the size of the dots that it's going to make for now are fine for the early layers. I tend to work broader, and as I work up into the light, make smaller and smaller dots because you're kind of getting into the mid-tone like I talked about where there's more information. Once I get into there, I do try to tend to use my nicer brushes. Um, I understand it's a sacrifice. It does kill these sable brushes to stipple with them in the way that I'm going to, but it gets me the results I want. So I don't know. You got to make your own call there of whether or not you care about mashing up the tips of your brushes to make really tiny patterns on stuff. Um, I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> Uh, Hilo Pilot also asked, uh, well, how do you, how, so another, just another response to how do you simplify it. On small scale, like I said a, a moment ago, you're going to be doing more, like Dan's talking about, stippling, but rather than stippling like the actual knitted pattern, you're going to just be stippling the, uh, if you're familiar with layering going from dark to light, you're going to be stippling your layers and the texture that that'll create is just going to give you the idea of there being of that being cloth. So here, right, I'm going to imagine that we've got light kind of coming down at your sort of normal zenithal angle of, you know, not maybe not quite straight above, but from the top. So I'm going to want most of my light concentrated here at the top of his head. And then it's also going to catch some of these other pieces that move away from it into varying degrees with the ultimate lights being right here on the top of his noggin. So I've just mixed a little bit of an off-white with my base blue to get a step up. And like Red's saying, this is 
this is layering with stippling. That's all we're doing today is layering with stippling. There might be some glazing in the mix, but for the most part, I think working dark to light on cloth is just really effective. It's easy to change things if you go step by step rather than trying to work in too many different directions at once. Um, so for this, I'm just going to be using the tip of the brush and we're going to start defining our volumes here. Um, as you can see, it's, it is still pretty small stippling strokes. Uh, I see a lot of people who talk about stippling and I see them going like this and really mashing the brush in. You don't get a lot of information that way. It's, you might as well just be painting, you know, you're smooshing it around so much. We are trying to create layers and layers of small dots on top of each other. Um, so you do still kind of want to keep the brush pointed um, so that you have some focus to the marks that you're making. And it's not just, you know, I, I see people trying to stipple 28 millimeter bottles with brushes like this. It, it Just paint it at that point. You're not getting the, the stippling effect anymore. You know, you, you, you want there to be these like, I don't know, it's almost like two overlaying or multiple overlaying webs of, of dots and stuff where some of the under layer shows through, but it's irregular. It creates irregularity. And that's a big thing with, you know, fabrics and stuff is having a little bit of irregularity goes a long way in selling it as sort of like a, uh, I don't know, a more natural type material in some ways. I'm just going to go across here. Stipple, stipple, stipple. Unfortunately, stippling is really boring to watch, but we're going to do it. And again, you don't have to be super, super clean with this. I think it works better if you're a little um, haphazard and just kind of let your brush wander around and make some marks and do this and that. You know, and What's I am... on the palette today, man? Um, just for right now, like... For this tone, I'm using AK's Dark Sea Blue. Uh, if you don't own a Dark Sea Blue from AK or Vallejo or Reaper, whoever, get one. It's a great tone. It's this nice, dark, I don't know, almost greenish blue color. I think this is a great, almost universal shadow, shadow tone. I hate to use the word universal for anything because nothing is. Um, and then this one, we're just lightening with some um, AK's Light Earth, which is like a warmish almost yellowy off-white, um, but it doesn't quite have enough yellow to make it super green, which is what I like about it. Over here, we got a little um, dark skin from Reaper, which I think this is just a really nice dark brown tone. I use this paint like a shitload because I'm too lazy to mix browns. Uh, we also have some of the new game colors, dark flesh tone. Uh, when I paint leather, I usually start with a dark brown and then start working my way up into flesh tones. Uh, it just gives a look that I like. So we'll use a little bit of this beige red today. We'll use a little bit of this amber gold from Reaper when we work on the leather part in a little bit. Um, for this cloth, though, I'm just going to use these two. This is going to be enough for me to get this sort of cloak that I want to get out of here. So we've got our first layer of, of kind of highlights down. And for me, this is already starting to give that sort of information that we're looking for with this. Sorry, my camera's not focusing the best, but you can see that we're you know, we've got a nice sort of modeling between darks and lights now. Um, so from here, I'd probably kick it up, mix a little bit more of that color in. Um, if people are newer to mixing, I think that just use pre-bottled colors. You don't have to do this whole like add a thing, add a thing. You could just find three or four tones in a row that work and use them. There's nothing wrong with using pre-bottled mixes. Don't let anyone bully you into mixing paints. It's stupid. You don't get extra points for mixing. Uh, so again, it's basically, you know, if you are familiar with layering, that's all we're going to be doing here is moving into smaller and smaller areas of coverage over what we've already done to show increasing amounts of light on different parts. So obviously we need to focus up on top here with a lot of this next pass because it's going to be catching a majority of the light compared to the other pieces. So again, we're just going to come in and just tap the tip of the brush against the model and transfer over our paint. You're using a Citadel brush? 
I am. I'm using a Citadel shade brush that I got for free from somewhere. And I have no idea where I got it, but <laughs> was it was it was sitting next to me, and I was like, "Huh, that's cool." Someone asked what brushes you use, and I was answering, and I was like, "Oh wait, he's using why is he, why is he Woo! using a Citadel brush?" Because it's I don't know. <laughs> for honestly, for like it, I can't tell if it's natural or synthetic. I think it's a blend of natural and synthetic. But for a free, for, no, it's a, this the oh, shade. Okay. Yeah. Um, for, I mean, like, I don't know. For a free brush, it's pretty nice. I wouldn't go buy this. You know, normally what I would use for this stage would be like this if it was in better condition. Uh, I love these artist loft brushes from Michaels and stuff. They're like four bucks for like a dozen of them. Uh, they're good trash brushes. But, you know, something like this is probably even a little too um, screwed up for me to want to do this layer, this level of stippling, unless it was a really big model and I wanted to get my early tones in with this. Um, I do find that I tend to move down in brush size as I move down in, in stroke size. I know everyone talks about, like, oh, you just need a number two, you can do everything. Like, you kind of can, but little brushes do make smaller marks. And that's it's true. It's not fake. It's not fake news. So again, I'm just going to mix. And actually, you can see some of the yellow is greening my color out a little bit, but that's okay. Shifting hues is always a little bit fun. Um, so here, you know, these are a little bit bigger than I like at this point in terms of the marks that I'm making. So I'm probably, you know, either you can do what sucks and really hold back and take forever using this bigger brush, or get rid of it and use something more appropriate. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna use the size zero Raphael B44 because it's on its way out. I've been using this one for a while, so I really don't care about it becoming my stipple brush now. So pick up a little what type of here. fabric are you trying to replicate here? Here, I would say just sort of like a rough spun wool, um, which, you know, generally, like if you go look at images of, of like rougher woolen garments they just have kind of like a modeled look to them there's not like it's not going to be like that knit where you've got those chevrons or a cross hatching pattern or anything um knit wool like this just tends to look more like a modeled surface um, which i think this is probably a good one if you're looking for something to try out this is easy because there's not you don't have to worry about the, a pattern to it or anything. It's just about light placement with this. Um, so you can see here I'm making smaller marks now, right? We're getting up into the, the tip of this and we're, we're putting much smaller marks down, which is giving us a different kind of level of, of information about all of this. Uh, two people asked how thin you're working, but also how much do you want the previous layer to be showing through with your next layer? Um, I tend to I, I tend to have the idea that the just like with brush size, like the further up into your highlights you work, I tend to thin my paint a little bit more. Whereas like what I've got back here is almost unthinned. Um, here there's a lot more water in it, and you can just see that when I pull it out. This is already pretty translucent um, compared to what we've got up here feels a lot more opaque when I pull it out and it's definitely a different um, you know level of mark on my skin when I'm putting it on there this is very faint compared to here I think that's important because if you stay really opaque all the way up much like layering you you just obscure everything before you're not letting any of it show through and you'll get really harsh um, transitions you know between them whereas this is already pretty pretty organic transitions between our different values here and different kind of colors. So as you move up, thin down a little bit, like especially for, for fabric and stuff, like stippling a glaze on is a really nice way to slowly and subtly build up texture. You do have to make sure you, you, you know, wick your brush pretty well over on your paper towel because if you have a glaze in there and you go to stipple and it's not wicked, it's just going to flood everywhere and you won't get marks. You're just going to get blobs, which isn't what we're after. We, we do want to get a, a pretty defined mark out of this. Just 
working on the edges a little bit. And the one thing too, like I talked about before, wool won't really do this because it's not as shiny as something like, you know, silk or, or rayon or any of those really reflective materials. So we are still going to keep our dots up into the main highlights. Whereas with something like, you know, silk, you might actually end up with more of like this in your highlight where you've got more of just a jump into uh, a, a broader, smoother highlight tone where the light is actually blowing out the information that the dots would normally be serving. Um, I don't think we'll go too, too much brighter than this because like I said, it's not super reflective material, but we still do want some nice contrast in the whole thing. Um, I think this is something too that you know when you're thinking about your overall model uh, fabric is a good way to balance different levels of contrast and things you know having a softer material surrounding a really strongly highlighted shiny material is only going to make that shiny thing feel shinier by comparison to this softer sort of lighting you know if this staff was like gold you know Compared to this, this is going to be really reflective, really shiny. This is going to be a lot broader lights on everything, not as high, not as sharp of a highlight. And the, the contrast between those two is going to make this feel shinier and make this feel softer. So in, in your overall model pet planning process, I think it's nice to get, like the models we looked at earlier, a mix of materials across them. If you paint all of your fabrics like to the same level of, of highlight and reflection, it's going to look a little weird. You're not going to get as much of a... I guess a story out of it, you know. How do you Don't... know you're on the right track when you're doing this? Um, I, I don't know. Take a look at it, you know. <laughs> like, does it? Does it? <laughs> it's, it's, I, it feels like an asshole answer, but it's honest. It's like we look at so much fabric in our life every day. Like we all wear clothes constantly. Like this is where reference comes in huge, right? Go find a picture of an old dude in a cloak that you like the look of the cloak on him take a look like what's what's going on here and does it match what's what's going on at the thing you're looking at and if it's not stop take a time out really break it down what's going on with your reference that you don't have going on that you need to have going on to get the the, the delta between them shortened um a lot of it is like i said volumes are huge for everything in miniature painting i feel like if people took a little bit more time to think about volumes their work's going to come out a lot better Right, like I could easily just paint, you know, he's got these, the, your sort of typical folds in the robe. I could just highlight the tips of all of these and call it a day and it would look okay. But if you look at the way it's even lit now, right? Like this top of this arm, because it's a cylinder sitting over this draping stuff, this is where the light's catching. All of this is getting obscured by the light hitting here. It's not getting down here as much. So you need to you need to think about the volumes if you want this to work well. On 28 millimeter, 32 millimeter, whatever, it matters a little bit less. But even like, I don't know, I was painting an, an orc guy last night, right? And here, I am still painting the outward pieces of the fabric, but I'm also painting inside of the creases where it goes in. Uh, if you do this, just try it. It's gonna look so much better because your your eye, it, it believes the illusion more, right? We expect light to fall a certain way because light is powers our world without light we can't see anything we're around it all the time it's just taking the time to think about what's always in front of you a little bit deeper and then be able to transfer it to your model i will go just a little bit and here you can see where i've gone up to my like this is going to be my final little bit of highlighting up here just to, to finish it off but i'm going to go pretty thin i'm going to go you know, this is basically a glaze now, like right on the cusp. And again, I'm going to come over here and wick it off a bit because I don't want it to flood out. But now this will make a much softer mark just by dint of being more diluted. It's, it's less opaque. It's more transparent. And this is where, for me, the really fun part comes in of going back and, and really kind of zhuzhing little parts to get a little bit more information. Like maybe it catches a little bit more down here. Because I've got this softer glaze, it's not leaving a really strong mark. It's just going to kind of melt into everything a bit. 
I have a question. Yeah. What the hell is zhuzhing? Zhuzh? You zhuzh it. You zhuzh it. You send it. Make it to the next level. You've never had zhuzh? <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Why Listen, they, you've obviously wondering. not watched enough Queer Eye for the straight <clears throat> guy. I have not watched any. Well, you blew it then. Yeah, that's my bad. You know, and here is kind of an interesting uh, example of volumes, right? Like, under here, if the light's coming this way, it's going to hit up here a bit. Down here is going to be a little bit darker. Then this is going to catch a little bit higher. Just try to think about those interactions and, and, and plan for them as you're layering up with your that initial first pass here. Gives you that kind of sketch work to then build up on. And you don't have to do dots, right? Like I'm just doing dots because that's that's the fabric I want here. You could just as easily do something, you know, where you start off with your darker tone and, you know, start making lines. And your lines are going to follow your highlights a bit more, something like that. Maybe you want to cross hatch it, you know, like this is another way you can start thinking about material information is like, okay, this is starting to look more like a really rough woven cotton or something like that versus this softer stippled. You know, it's just, it's all about your brush strokes and, and how you're going to go about it. Like when I paint denim, I tend to make little tiny lines because if you look at your jeans or something, it's all pretty linear. It all kind of runs in the direction of it. You don't really get the whites moving side to side. They're all moving up and down as the you know, undyed core of the fibers are revealed over time as you wear them. And those are just the little, like, kind of spending some time in, in observation, I think pays off hugely when you go to actually try it on the model, because you have a better idea of, like, what part of the illusion do you need to bring across to make it convincing? You know, if you just take a big brush with white on it and stamp it onto a blue background, it's not going to look like denim. It's just not going to have the same effect. All right, so that's that part there. I think I'm going to move on and do a little bit of leather because leather is always fun for me. And I like to talk about it. We'll do his glove because that's kind of a good one. Um, so again, very similar thing. I'm just going with, you know, this is all going to be layering today. So we're going to take, you know, a nice brownie color. Maybe I'll actually mix a touch of the blue in to make it a little darker. Slap a quick base coat on. And then we'll start making leather. Um, my secret weapon, and this is something that I gleaned from our, our main man, old red piano here for leather, is some sort of brown ink. Uh, lately, I've been lazy and just been using uh, the snakebite leather contrast from, from Games Workshop, but I'll show you where that comes in later. Getting like a sepia ink from Daily Rowney or Liquitex or someone or, or Vallejo, Scale, whoever, you know, basically just having a nice brown ink. I think goes a long way towards getting a good leather look. Because um, one of the big things with leather, in, in my mind at least, is the difference between a polished factory new look and how leather degrades and gains character over time. I'm just over here airbrushing that base coat dry real quick so we can just keep it moving. Oh, yeah. Is stippling and glazing the only recommended way to achieve this or just the best? Could you use wet blending to get anything similar? Uh, wet blending, <laughs> I think, not so much because that's that's for creating smooth transitions between colors, right? Like the whole idea with wet blending is like you're going to put some of this on, you're going to put some of this on next to it, and then on the model you're going to do what I did right here between those two colors to get your, your sort of gradient. For, for me, most cloths, and not all of them, but most cloths are about a texture, right? Like, because they are a knit of some sort, they catch light in a way that is diffused and broken up as it catches that surface. You know, even like a plain black, like, you know, sweatshirt or something, like, there's, there's still information to it that you're not going to get if you just create, like, a very smooth blend on it. There's some stuff where that's effective, like sh very shiny materials tend to be very smooth. You know, like silk is smooth. You don't really need to use stippling on there. You can if you if you want to, to really get that. Because even with silk, when you zoom in, you do see those micro little places where you have, you know, 
an overlapping of fibers like everything's woven basically so you're you're dealing with that it's not like we're wearing a sheet of plastic or something i don't think that well i mean does underwear count i've seen blade runner yeah uh, <laughs> but yeah if something like that like if you're going to use like a holy like I don't know, like pleather or something. Yeah, wet blending probably works great for that. Um, at least for getting in your initial values and stuff. And no, you don't have to use stippling and glazing. Um, I will say though, if you want stuff to be smooth in the end, um, you're gonna have to glaze. <laughs> That's just kind of unfortunately like uh, uh, part of it. You can glaze with the airbrush, you can glaze with the brush, but if you really want smooth, smooth, that's that's the way you do it. All right, so let's get in and look at his glove, right? So when I think about leather and I approach painting leather, I think it's really important to start to think about the story, right? Um, if somebody's got a leather glove, where is it going to get worn, right? Uh, mostly at like the wrist, so we're putting it on and off, at the knuckles because that's a, a point where your hand's going to flex against it a lot. Obviously the palm side is going to wear out a lot faster than the back most of the time. So I, I think part of selling this too is like, what's what's the story behind the material? What are you trying to get out of it? Um, with this, we're gonna do something very similar. Shocking, I know. I'm gonna take a little bit of this sort of reddish tone, mix a little white in. This is gonna basically give us kind of like, you know, a skin tone here. You could just go ahead and use something more like this, you know, premix skin tone, and probably you know bridge it with your base color a little bit, unless you have a good thing that's already intermediate to that. Um, with leather, I think is very, very forgiving. You can work very rough and then keep refining it in layers. And that's the way I like to do it because for me, it gives it the most depth. So I'm just going to come in and kind of quickly sketch in where I want some of this wear and tear to be, mostly just using, you know, the tip slash side of my brush. Um, you know, we know that where these wrinkles are, that's going to be something that's worn away a lot. Maybe it's more scuffed up here on his knuckles. So I'm going to stipple up into that a bit to give you that, that feel that it's getting stretched out there. Um, and again, still trying to pay attention to the volumes within this, right? Like the light's going to catch across a knuckle and kind of follow the bone of your hand back about halfway till it sort of disappears into the wrist. And again, it doesn't, the one thing that I like about leather is like, it comes in every freaking color you can ever imagine. If you want to do blue leather, black leather, green leather, do it. It's, it's more about the information that you're putting in here than it is the color, much like something like non-metallic metal where the tone, unless you're trying to get a specific metal, doesn't matter as much. Um, but here we're just going to do some, some general stippling Get this bottom knuckle a little bit too and the top of the hand because it's getting the most light is going to get more of the stipples uh, i think already right like we've kind of got in that quick little blah 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 we're already on the right path this is already to me starting to look like leather same thing we're just going to layer up so i'm going to mix some of this other off-white sandy tone in here leather i think it's fine to do be a little more aggressive in your jumps in value. I don't think you need to do as much of a, a softer gradient because there is a bigger disparity between, you know, your shiny leather surface and then where it's cut and marked and marred. So again, I'm just going to use kind of irregular dots on this. Um, the other thing I really like doing with leather in, in layers and everything is if you have a nice sharp brush and your paint's diluted nicely, you know, somewhere between maybe just a little bit thinner than you normally would for layering. Um, trying to get some nice short little scuffs and nicks in really sells the tone of it for me. Because um, once you scratch leather, it's scratched, right? Like there's no way you're you're getting rid of that really. Um, and it's kind of a hallmark of that look of like creased or, or, or worn leather. And here, this might start to look way too bright and that's okay. You can take this up really high going to go to almost like a pure off white for a lot of this because what we're going to do is come back and knock it all down and unify it a bit uh, again this is something i picked up from red i really like this this is like 
basically the only way I paint leather anymore because I just enjoy the process. I like the end result a lot. Um, and for me, it's you can be kind of slapstick with it, you know. So now we've got all that on there. And the next thing to do is to glaze it all back down a bit into homogeny. So again, I'm going to take some of this sneak bite, contrast, leather, whatever the hell it's called stuff. Um, throw some of that down. You can see it's this nice, richer, darker sepia brown ink. Um, I'm going to thin it down a bit just because I don't want it to completely eradicate everything that I've got on there. And that's a big thing too. If you go get like Daylight Rounding ink or something, don't glaze with it straight on there. It's it's pretty opaque. It's just going to destroy all this. We want to keep this information, but start bringing it back together a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to you know quickly glaze this over the whole surface. That's going to tint all of my highlights back towards where I'm also tinting my mids and shadows, which you know again brings everything back together. The other thing that I like this for is that most inks are going to be pretty naturally glossy right out of the gate. Um, so we're going to basically make this whole thing a little bit glossy right now. And then we're going to go back and work those textured highlights again and repeat it and go back and forth a few times. And what that's going to end up doing is on these more factory finish parts of it are going to be glossy compared to where we're working more layers of paint up are going to be matter. And that's exactly how leather works, right? Like as you tear through that finished surface into the material underneath, that material underneath is fuzzy, it's matte, it catches light a bit differently. And I, that, that's a big thing that for me of like having a, a variety of finishes in the model, having some sheen in parts of your leather and then some matteness in your highlights really sells that information to, to my brain at least. Actually, we'll go fancy. We'll use one of our people always people always shit on these. This is one of the Series Seven miniature brushes. These are great stippling brushes. They're spendy for what it is, but boy, do they make nice little marks because they have that nice tight stiff point to them. So I like these a lot for doing textural work. So we're gonna grab some of our other tones again and come back in here maybe pick out some things that we kind of missed a little bit like the back of his this other shape we've got this triangular crease here where there's that's another volume that we're gonna you know mark out a little bit um, and I like this with the leather because it's you know if you found that you've gone way too high on all these marks and you've kind of lost your way just glaze over it three or four times and it's gonna really knock it all down and then you can build back up and, and get your information back. Why are you using ink at this stage rather than in earlier stages of the job, of the work? Um, just because I'm using it as a filter to, to unify the values a bit more, to squash everything down. You could, you could put ink on in the beginning too if you want. It's just not going to have the same effect as glazing it over all of these marks, which is... You know, as you saw, we went up to like basically this bone color. We'll now look at how yellowed it is because of the glazing that we've put over it. If my camera will ever freaking focus, come on. Damn it. You know, that's a lot different than it was two minutes ago. And that's why I like to use the ink where it's like, do a layer of stippling, glaze over it. Do a layer of stippling, glaze over it. I probably wouldn't do this on like, you know, one of these 28 millimeters. I would probably just do it once and call it a day because it's... It's th they're small, it doesn't matter. But for something a little more finished where it's going to be more of a, a prominent detail, I think this back and forth does a really nice job of building up the texture, giving you the information and the variety of finishes all at once. You know, there's, there's a... Says, oh, yeah. He says, I meant why use a filter to squash the values now instead of stippling and layering with lower value jumps earlier? I mean, you, you, you can, but this is also bringing in those glossy tones to it, right? It's doing two things. It's, it's squishing this, but it's also bringing in multiple finishes. I mean, it's not, it's not the only way to do it by any means. This is just the way I like to approach painting leather because it works for me. I always get a nice result out of it. It's just kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, it works. So I use it. <laughs> So 
Uh, I think too, like if you really want to go wild with leather, bringing a whole bunch of different hues in is pretty cool. If you like bring some greens in, bring some yellows in, and then use that glazing again to unify them, you get a broader range of variety through the tones. I'll grab some more of that ink and just lay it over here. Try that again real quick. I think too, part of it, I guess for me is like a, I do like to save time when I can. And like, yes, I could painstakingly mix a whole set of tones from dark to light and really work my way up the gradient. But this way I don't have to. I can just mix like three and each pass is creating, you know, as these passes and layers of ink are building up, the stuff that was here before the second glaze is going to look so different than the stuff that I put on the third and then glaze over it. You're kind of creating those different steps by, you know, different back and forth, if that makes sense. Oh, no lamp. No lamp. There we go. And we'll go in here a little softer and kind of near the end. Really want the knuckles to wear out. But you can see with this, like you can get really nice tiny little marks out of these Series 7 minis, which is what I really like about them. Because it's not as long of a brush, there's not as much flex. Oh, thanks, Siri. I mean, the other thing you can think about too is if you don't want ink to create the glossiness, just like you would with, say, like the reflection of an eye or a gem or something, what you could do is take sort of like an off white color and paint sort of like a, uh, you know, reflection in the darker parts of the leather to make it feel shiny versus this, like, you know, and it would be like a smooth highlight, it wouldn't be a stippled one. And then you're giving contrast between the way the light's shining on the two different elements of it. Right, like it's a smooth highlight on the glossy and a stippled highlight where it's worn away. Um, I just like using an actual glossy finish because I think it looks nice for holding it, you know, and actually looking at it. It makes it feel like it's actual leather. I know that the contrasts aren't all that glossy compared to like a real ink, so you don't get quite the same look out of it, but it's pretty close and it's what I have at hand because I think I broke my sepia ink the other day or something. I couldn't find it. I killed it. There How we go. You? I don't know. I hate, I hate ink. These I hate the De La Rowney ink bottles. They suck. I want those schminky arrows because they're square. <laughs> That's literally the only reason I want them is because they have square glass bottles. And they fit in my drawer better. Understandable. Form. Maybe. But I think, you know, so far for the, what, like 15, 20 minutes we've done this, I, I think this is already starting to be, you know, at least for me, pretty convincing that this is like a leather material, right? And again, we've used, what, like three colors. You could do two if you really felt like mixing. You could use a whole gamut of leather colors. It's up to you. I do find, though, that, like, people tend to stick to mostly just brown browns. Try using flesh tones next time you do leather. Um it, it looks nice. It works, especially if you're glazing them back into homogeny a little bit. It's just the way the other looks when it rips open. It is very, like, kind of a pinky, off-white color. Rather than just more of the same brown with white added or something. But I think the biggest thing for me is, like, if you enjoy this process, like, really lean into it. It's fun to sit here and just kind of make all these little tiny scuffs and scratches and you know the more information the more story you're telling with this in my mind and they don't always have to be stipples like you can use some some more linear strokes and stuff it's you know, 
do whatever, try it out, see what works, see what gives you the result you're looking for. And take notes when you do. You know, if you have a good success, I, I like to try and write it down now. Like, hey, I tried doing it this way. And this is, you know, take a picture, save it in your phone. This is the outcome. Having a little journal for yourself, I think, could be really helpful and motivating. Five minutes from the one hour mark. <clears throat> yeah, I'm basically wrapping up now. All right, well, I'll take this last five minutes. And, you know, if anyone has any other questions, happy to... Do my best to answer them. Is this miniature primed with black and white Xenothal? Uh, yeah. I mean, not so much a Xenothal, because I guess I just kind of like... I don't know. Yes. Short answer, yes. It was originally just black, and then I did spray some white anchor to me or something over it. Um, which, you know, perfectly valid if you want to do cloth. I think that's a good way to see those volumes that I was talking about without having to do it by brush. Just, you know, do your spray on there and yeah, it gives you a good sense of where light would hit and just try and follow that with your subsequent layers. Um, working up from black is fine too. It's, it really is just purely personal preference. If you can visualize where everything's going to be or if you use a glossy black primer and hold it under the light, you know, even just with this, you can kind of get a sense of like, okay, if light was coming here, this is what it's going to hit. And you can see, like I was talking about, it hits that inside crease, right? And it hits the tip of this. It doesn't hit the space between them all that much because they're in different planes, right? This is a plane, and the inside of there is the same plane. These planes are facing kind of an X across from each other. And that's that's a lot of what's looking at, okay, what are the shapes here? Where is the light hitting? That's going to give you... the the indicator of where to put your paint, and then you'll get a better end result. How do you differentiate between something being light from wear versus from lighting? Say that again? How do you differentiate between something being light from wear, like, you know, the, the wear in leather is lighter than the base color typically? Oh, yeah versus actual lighting reflecting off of the material well it's gonna be it's gonna be both right like if light's hitting an area that's worn it's gonna pick up all those imperfections because it's it's effectively not a smooth surface anymore light's catching on all these scratches and stuff so that's where you will get more of this i think you kind of use them in tandem like i could if i wanted to give the illusion that that light was hitting down here more where it's still somewhat unweathered you might use something that's just more like a regular brush stroke, right? Because it's it's a smoother reflection down there versus this stippled, broken up, diffused reflection that you get up here. Does that does that answer it? If not, I, I can try and attack it in a different way. But um, like the reason you're seeing the texture is because the light's hitting it. If it was all in shadow, you wouldn't see texture. Because there's not enough light there to highlight that information. You just could have a smooth dark shadow. They says, yeah, great answer. There's also a question if you will post the mini, a photograph of the mini somewhere so that people can see it. Yeah, yeah, I'll take I'll take a couple of pictures of this and put it up. I'll put it up in um, the fabric along, paint along that we have going on that people kind of made as a. That's gonna serve the purpose of our. You know, last time we did the NMM feedback thread. This time we're just going to do the fabric along. If you want to join in, great. If you don't feel like joining the paint along and you still want to post your stuff that's got fabric in there, feel free to tag me in there. I'll do my best to take a look at it and give you any, you know, thoughts, feedbacks, notes, whatever. I have posted a link in the chat. Fantastic. Um as always, thank you to anyone who took the time to chime in today. I always appreciate it. This is something I really enjoy doing for the server. Um, I think Red's planning on doing Flesh in the future. Yeah, I'll do it in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, so that'll be sort of the next workshop. Um, I'd love to keep these going. So if you guys have ideas for other things, feel free to you know tag us with them. Um, I think this is kind of a cool and unique thing that our server is doing that I'd, I'd love to keep it moving forward. So. Um, again, thank you everybody for, for your time today. Um, uh, feel free to, to tag me with, with any questions ever on the server. I'm, I'm always happy to, to help out where I can. So, 
um, 